Chapter 15 of Music Notation and Terminology. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Music Notation and Terminology by Carl Wilson Gerkins. Chapter 15 Terms Relating to Forms and Styles Continued. Sections 144 to 160 relate particularly to terms used in descriptions of monophonic music. Begin footnote. There is a very pronounced disagreement among theorists as to what terms are to be used in referring to certain forms and parts of forms, and it seems impossible to make a compromise that will satisfy even a reasonable number. In order to make the material in this chapter consistent with itself, therefore, it has been thought best by the author to follow the terminology of some single recognized work on form, and the general plan of monophonic form here given is therefore that of the volume called Musical Form by Bustler Cornell. End footnote. 144. A phrase is a short musical thought, at least two measures in length, closing with either a complete or an incomplete cadence. The typical phrase is four measures long. The two-measure phrase is often called section. The word phrase, as used in music terminology, corresponds with the same word as used in language study. 145. A period is a little piece of music typically eight measures long, either complete in itself or forming one of the clearly defined divisions of a larger form. The period, when complete in itself, is the smallest monophonic form. The essential characteristic of the regular period is the fact that it usually consists of two balanced phrases, often called antecedent and consequent, or thesis and antithesis. The first phrase giving rise to the feeling of incompleteness, by means of a cadence in another key, deceptive cadence, etc., the second phrase giving the effect of completeness, by means of a definite cadence at the close. The second half of the period is sometimes a literal repetition of the first half, in all respects except the cadence, but in many cases, too, it is a repetition of only one of the elements, rhythm, intervals, or general outline. Figures 58 and 59 show examples of both types. The principle almost invariably holds that the simpler the music— cf. folk tunes, the more obvious the form of the period, while the more complex the music, the less regular the period. Figure 58. Figure 59. One forty six. The primary forms are built up by combining two or more periods. The small two part primary form, often called song form or lead form, consists of two periods so placed that the second constitutes a consequent or antithesis to the first. The second half of this second period is often exactly the same as the second half of the first period, thus binding the two periods together into absolute unity. The theme of the choral movement of the Ninth Symphony, Beethoven, quoted below, is a perfect example of this form. Other examples are Drink to Me Only with Thine Eyes and The Last Rose of Summer. 3-part primary form is like the 2-part primary form, except that it has a section of contrasting material interpolated between the two periods. This middle part is usually an 8-measure phrase. 
The large two- and three-part primary forms usually have sixteen measure periods instead of eight measure ones, but are otherwise similar in construction. These various primary forms are used in constructing many varieties of compositions, among them the theme and variations, the polka, the waltz, the march, etc., as well as most of the shorter movements in sonatas, quartets, etc. They are used in vocal music also, but are less apt to be regular here, because the form of vocal music is largely dependent upon the structure of the text. 147. A theme is a fragment of melody used as the subject of a fugue, as the basis of the development section in sonata form, etc. Sometimes it is a complete tune, often in period form, on which variations are made, as, e.g., in the familiar theme and variations. 148. Thematic development consists in taking a short theme, or several short themes, and by means of transposition, interval expansion and contraction, rhythmic augmentation and diminution, inversion, tonality changes, etc., building out of it a lengthy composition or section of a composition. Figure 60, B, C, D, E, and F show how the theme given in figure 60, A may be varied in a few of these ways. There are hundreds of other fashions in which this same theme might be varied without destroying its identity. For other examples of thematic development, see the development section of Sonata, Opus 31, Number 3, as analyzed in Appendix E. Figure 60 For further illustrations of development in the case of this same theme, see Cristiani, The Principles of Expression in Pianoforte Playing, page 144, FF, from which the foregoing themes have been adapted. 149. A rondo is an instrumental composition, in homophonic style, in which a certain theme appears several times, almost always in the same form, i.e. not thematically varied, the repetitions of this theme being separated by contrasting material. The rondo is the oldest of the larger monophonic forms, and has been used in many different ways, but perhaps its most characteristic construction is as follows. 1. Principal subject. 2. Second subject in dominant key. 3. Principal subject. 4. Third subject. 5. First subject again. 6. Second subject in tonic key. 7. Coda or ending. The student should note particularly the problem of repetition and contrast, mentioned in section 134, as here worked out, as the rondo was the first monophonic form in which this matter was at all satisfactorily solved, and its construction is especially interesting because it is readily seen to be one of the direct predecessors of the highest form of all, the sonata. Examples of rondos may be found in any volume of sonatas or sonatinas. 150. A suite is a set of instrumental dances, all in the same or in nearly related keys. The first dance is usually preceded by an introduction or prelude, and the various dances are so grouped as to secure contrast of movement, a quick dance being usually followed by a slower one. The suite is interesting to students of the development of music as being the first form in several movements to be generally adopted by composers. It retained its popularity from the beginning of the 17th to the end of the 18th centuries, being finally displaced by the sonata, whose immediate predecessor it is thus seen to be. The suite was formerly written for solo instrument only, harpsichord, clavichord, piano, but modern composers like Dvorak, Lachner, Moskowski, and others have written suites for full orchestra also. 151. Among the dances commonly found in suites are the following. Allemande, duple or quadruple measure. Bolero, triple measure. Boré, duple or quadruple measure. 
Chacon, triple measure. Courant, a very old dance in triple measure. Xardas, Hungarian dance in duple or quadruple measure. Gavotte, quadruple measure. Jig, or jig, duple measure. Habanera, Spanish dance in triple measure. Minuet, slow dance in triple measure. Mazurka, Polish dance in triple measure. Polonaise, Polish dance in triple measure. Rigadon, lively dance in duple or triple measure. Sarabande, triple measure. Tarantella, swift Italian dance in sextuple measure. The Allemande is especially interesting to students of music form because of its relation to the sonata, it being the prototype of the sonata allegro, i.e., the first movement of the sonata. The Sarabande and Courant are likewise interesting as the prototypes of the second movement, and the Boré, Minuet, etc., for their connection with the third movement. 152. The Scherzo, literally musical joke, is a fanciful instrumental composition. It was used by Beethoven as the third movement of the sonata, instead of the more limited minuet, but is also often found as an independent piece. 153. A sonata is an instrumental composition of three or more movements, usually four, the first and last of which are almost always in rapid tempo. Each of these movements is a piece of music with a unity of its own, but they are all merged together in a larger whole with a broad underlying unity of larger scope. The composition receives its name from the fact that its first movement is cast in sonata form. See section 157 for description of sonata form. When the sonata has four movements, these are usually arranged as follows. 1. A quick movement, allegro, presto, etc., often preceded by a slower introduction. 2. A slow movement, largo, andante, adagio, etc. 3. A minuet or scherzo, often with a trio added, in which case the part preceding the trio is repeated after the trio is played. 4. A quick movement, the finale, sometimes a rondo, sometimes another sonata form, sometimes a theme with variations. These movements are all in closely related keys, but in a variety of contrasting rhythms. 154. A trio is a sonata for three instruments, such as piano, violin, and cello, while a quartet is a sonata for four instruments, the most common quartet combination being as follows, first and second violins, viola, and violoncello. The term chamber music is often applied to instrumental music for trio, quartet, quintet, and other similar combinations, which are suitable for a small room, rather than for a large concert hall. The words trio and quartet are also applied to vocal works for three or four voices respectively, these having no relation whatsoever to the sonata as described above. The word trio is also applied to the middle section of minuets, scherzas, marches, etc., the term originating in the old usage of writing this part for three instruments only. 155. A concerto is a sonata for a solo instrument with orchestral accompaniment, the form being usually somewhat modified so as to adapt it to a composition in which there must necessarily be opportunity for a good deal of technical display. There are usually but three movements in the concerto. The great majority of concertos are for piano and orchestra, but examples of concertos for violin, cello, flute, oboe, and other solo instruments all with orchestral accompaniment, have also been written. A few modern composers have applied the term concerto to certain large organ works, with no orchestral accompaniment, the composition being written for just the one instrument. But this use of the word is so contrary to the accepted definition that it is hardly justifiable. When a concerto is played on two pianos, without orchestra, this does not mean that there is no orchestral part, but that there is no orchestra to play it, and so the parts that should be played by the orchestral instruments have simply been arranged for a second piano, sometimes organ. 156. A symphony is a sonata for full orchestra. 
In general, its construction is the same as that of the sonata, but it is usually of much larger proportions, and has in it much greater variety of both tonal and rhythmic material. The symphony is generally conceded to be the highest type of instrumental music ever evolved. The symphony was accepted as a standard form in the time of Haydn, 1732 to 1809, and was developed enormously by Haydn himself, Mozart, 1756 to 1791, and Beethoven, 1770 to 1827, reaching perhaps its highest point in the famous Nine Symphonies of the last-named composer. Later symphony writers whose works are at present being performed include Schumann, Tchaikovsky, and Dvorak. The word symphony was formerly used synonymously with ritornel, both words being applied to instrumental interludes between parts of vocal works, but this usage has now entirely disappeared. 157. Sonata form, sometimes called sonata allegro, is a plan for the construction of instrumental music, sonatas, quartets, symphonies, etc., in which three rather definite divisions always occur, the third division being a more or less literal repetition of the first. These three parts of sonata form with their usual subdivisions are 1. Exposition 1. Principal theme or first subject 2. Link episode or modulation group 3. Secondary theme or song group, always in a nearly related key 4. Closing group 5. Coda 2. Development section Treating the themes introduced in the exposition in an almost infinite variety of fashions, according to the principles of thematic development. See section 148. 3. Recapitulation or reprise. Consisting essentially of the same subdivisions found in the exposition, but differing from this first section in one essential point, viz., that instead of stating the secondary theme in a related key, the entire recapitulation is in the principal key. This third section is always followed by a coda, which may either be very short or quite extended, bringing the whole movement to a more definite close. The second part of sonata form, the development section, is sometimes the longest and most intricate of the three divisions, and it is at this point that the composer has an opportunity of displaying to the full his originality and inventive skill. It is principally because of this development section that the sonata is so far superior as a form to its predecessors. For an analyzed example of sonata form, see Appendix E. The student is advised to take other sonatas and go through the first movements with a view to finding at least the three main divisions mentioned above. In some cases the form will, of course, be so irregular that all the parts indicated cannot be discovered, but the general outlines of the scheme will always be present. 158. A sonatina, as its name implies, is a little sonata. It differs from the sonata proper, principally in having little or no development, the second section being of slight importance as compared with the corresponding section of a sonata. A grand sonata is like an ordinary sonata in form, but is of unusually large dimensions. 159. Program music is instrumental music which is supposed to convey to the listener an image, or a succession of images, that will arouse in him certain emotions which have been previously aroused in the composer's mind by some scene, event, or idea. The clue to the general idea is usually given at the beginning of the music in the form of a poem, or a short description of the thing in the mind of the composer, but there are many examples in which there is no clue whatsoever, except the title of the composition. Program music represents a mean between pure music, cf. the piano sonata or the string quartet, on the one hand, and descriptive music, in which actual imitations of bird calls, whistles, the blowing of the wind, the galloping of horses, the rolling of thunder, etc., occur, on the other. Most program music is written for the orchestra, examples being Liszt's The Preludes, Strauss's Till Eulenspiegel, etc. 160. 
A symphonic poem, or tone poem, is an orchestral composition of large dimensions, resembling the symphony in size, usually embodying the program idea. It has no prescribed form, and seems indeed to be often characterized by an almost total lack of design, but there are also examples of symphonic poems in which the same theme runs throughout the entire composition, being adapted at the various points at which it occurs to the particular moods expressed by the program at those points. The symphonic poem was invented by Liszt, 1811-1886, and has since been used extensively by Strauss, Saint-Saëns, and others. It came into existence as a part of the general movement which has caused the fugue and the sonata successively to go out of fashion, viz., the tendency to invent forms which would not hamper the composer in any way, but would leave him absolutely free to express his ideas in his own individual way. End of chapter 15 Read by Kara Schallenberg on August 25, 2009 in San Diego, California Dean of Music Notation and Terminology. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Miriam Goldman. Music Notation and Terminology by Carl Wilson Gerkins. Chapter 16. Chapter 16. Terms Relating to Vocal Music. 161. An anthem is a sacred choral composition, usually based on biblical or liturgical. Began footnote. A liturgy is a prescribed form or method of conducting a religious service, and the part sung in such a service, as exempli gratia, the Holy Communion, baptism, etc., are referred to as the musical liturgy. End footnote. Words. It may or may not have an instrumental accompaniment, and is usually written in four parts, but may have five, six, eight, or more. The word anthem is derived from antiphona, or antiphona, meaning a psalm or hymn sung responsively, i.e., antiphonally, by two choirs, or by choir and congregation. A full anthem is one containing no solo parts. A solo anthem is one in which the solo part is predominant over the chorus, while a verse anthem is one in which the chorus parts alternate with passages for concerted solo voices. It est, trios, quartets, etc. 162. A cappella, sometimes spelled capella or a la cappella music, is part singing, either sacred or secular, without accompaniment. This term means literally in chapel style, and refers to the fact that in the early days of the church all singing was unaccompanied. 163. A motet is a sacred choral composition in contrapuntal style. It has no solo parts, thus corresponding to the madrigal, quod vidi, in secular music. The motet is intended for a cappella performance, but is often given with organ accompaniment. 164. A choral is a hymn tune of the German Protestant Church. It is usually harmonized in four voices. The choral, sometimes spelled choral, is described as having a plain melody, a strong harmony, and a stately rhythm. It differs from the ordinary English and American hymn tune in being usually sung at a much slower tempo and in having a pause at the end of each line of text. 165. The Mass is the liturgy for the celebration of the Lord's Supper in the service of the Roman Catholic Church. As used in the terminology of music, the word refers to the six hymns, which are always included when a composer writes a musical Mass, and which form the basis of the celebration of the Communion. Begin footnote. It should be understood that this statement refers to the service called the High Mass only, there being no music at all in connection with the so-called Low Mass. End footnote. These six hymns are as follows. 
Kyrie, Gloria, including the Gratius Agimus, Quaetolus, Quonium, Com Sancto Spirito, Credo, including the Et Incarnatus, Crucifixus, and Et Resurrexit, Sanctus, including the Hosanna, Benedictus, Agnus Dei, including the Dona Nobis. The Requiem Mass is the Mass for the Dead, and differs considerably from the ordinary Mass. Both regular and Requiem Masses have been written by many of the great composers, Bach, Beethoven, Verdi, Gounod, and in many cases these Masses are so complex that they are not practicable for the actual service of the Church, and are therefore performed only by large choral societies as concert works. 166. A cantata is a vocal composition for chorus and soloists, the text being either sacred or secular. The accompaniment may be written for piano, organ, or orchestra. When sacred in character, the cantata differs from the oratorio in being shorter and less dramatic, in not usually having definite characters, and in being written for church use, while the oratorio is intended for concert performance. When secular in subject, the cantata differs from the opera in not usually having definite characters, and in being always rendered without scenery or action. Examples of the sacred cantata are Steiner's The Crucifixion, Clough Leiter's The Righteous Branch, and Gaul's The Holy City. Examples of the secular cantata are Bruch's Arminius, Coleridge Taylor's Hiawatha. 167. An oratorio is a composition on a large scale for chorus, soloists, and orchestra, the text usually dealing with some religious subject. The oratorio, as noted above, is not intended for the church service, but is written for concert performance. 168. An opera is a composition for vocal soloists, chorus, and orchestra, with characters, action, scenery, and dramatic movement. It is a drama set to music. Grand opera is opera with a serious plot, in which everything is sung, there being no spoken dialogue at all. Opera comique is a species of opera in which part of the dialogue is spoken and part sung. Opera comique is not synonymous with comic opera, for the plot of opera comique is as often serious as not. In fact, the entire distinction between the terms grand opera and opera comique is being broken down, the latter term referring merely to operas first given at the opera comique in Paris, and the former term to those given at the grand opera house in the same city. A comic opera is a humorous opera, the plot providing many amusing situations and the whole ending happily. It corresponds with the comedy in literature. A light opera is one with an exceedingly trivial plot, in which songs, dances, and pretty scenery contribute to the amusement of the audience. The music is lively, but usually as trivial as the plot. The term music drama was used by Wagner in referring to his own operas, and is also sometimes applied to other modern operas in which the dramatic element is supposed to predominate over the musical. 169. A libretto, literally, little book, is the word text of an opera, oratorio, cantata, or some other similar work. 170. Recitative is a style of vocal solo common to operas, oratorios, and cantatas, especially those written some time ago. Its main characteristic is that the word text is of paramount importance, both rhythm and tone progression being governed by rhetorical rather than musical considerations. Recitative undoubtedly originated in the intoning of the priest in the ritualistic service of the church, but when applied to the opera, it became an important means of securing dramatic effects, especially in situations in which the action of the play moved along rapidly. Recitative is thus seen to be a species of musical declamation. In the early examples of recitative, there was scarcely any accompaniment, often only one instrument, like the cello, being employed to play a sort of obligato melody, 
When full chords were played, they were not written out in the score, but were merely indicated in a more or less general way by certain signs and features. See Thorough Bass, page 85, section 200. But about the middle of the 17th century, a slightly different style of recitative was invented, and in this type the orchestra was employed much more freely in the accompaniment, especially in the parts between the phrases of the text, but to some extent also to support the voice while singing. This new style was called recitativo strumento, id est, accompanied recitative, while the original type was called recitativo secco, id est, dry recitative. During the last century the style of recitative has been still further developed by Gluck and Wagner, both of whom used the orchestra as an independent entity, with interesting melodies, harmonies, and rhythms all its own, while the vocal part is a sort of obligato to this accompaniment. But even in this latest piece of recitative, it is the word text that decides the style of both melody and rhythm in the voice part. Figure 61 shows an example of dry recitative taken from the Messiah. Behold, a virgin shall conceive, and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel, God with us. 171. Aria is likewise a style of vocal solo found in operas, etc., but its predominating characteristic is diametrically opposed to that of the recitative. In the aria, the word text is usually entirely subordinate to the melody, and the latter is often very ornate, containing trills, runs, etc. The rendition of this ornate style of music is often referred to as coloratura singing, but it should be noted that not all arias are coloratura in style. The familiar solos from The Messiah, Rejoice Greatly, and The Trumpet Shall Sound, are good examples of the aria style. 172. A lead, German song, is a vocal solo in which the text, the melody, and the accompaniment contribute more or less equally to the effect of the whole. Strictly speaking, the word lead means a poem to be sung, and this meaning will explain at once the difference between the lead on the one hand and the Italian recitative and aria on the other. For in the lead the text is of great importance, but the music is also interesting, while in the recitative the text was important, but the music very slight, and in the aria the text was usually inconsequential, while the music held the center of interest. The most pronounced characteristic of the lead is the fact that it usually portrays a single mood, sentiment, or picture, thus differing from the ballad, which is narrative in style. It will be noted that this single mood, or sentiment, or picture was originally conceived by the poet who wrote the word text, and that the composer in writing music to this text has first tried to get at the thought of the poet, and then has attempted to compose music which would intensify and make more vivid that thought. The intensification of the poet's thought comes as often through the rhythm, harmony, and dynamics of the accompaniment as through the expressiveness of the voice part. The style of songwriting in which each verse is sung to the same tune is called the strophe form, while that in each verse has a different melody is often referred to as the continuous or through composed, from German durch Kampagnart. 173. A ballad was originally a short, simple song, the words being in narrative style, id est, the word text telling a story. In the earlier ballads, each verse of the poem was usually sung to the same tune, strophe form, but in the art ballad, as developed by Lowe and others, the continuous style of composition is employed, this giving the composer greater opportunities of making vivid through his music the events described by the poem. These later ballads are in consequence neither short nor simple, but compare in structure with the lead itself. 174. A folk song is a short song sung by and usually originating among the common people. Its dominant characteristic is usually simplicity, this applying to word, text, melody, and accompaniment, if there is one. The text of the folk song is usually based on some event connected with ordinary life, but there are also many examples in which historical and legendary happenings are dealt with. Auld Lang Syne and Coming Through the Rye are examples of folk songs. 
There has been some difference of opinion as to whether a song, the composer of which is known, can ever constitute a real folk song. Recent writers seem to be taking the sensible view of the matter. Vitaleset that if a song has the characteristics of a folk rather than an art song, and if it remains popular for some time among the common people, then it is just as much a folk song whether the composer happens to be known or not. 175. A madrigal is a secular vocal composition having from three to eight parts. It is in contrapuntal style, like the motet, and is usually sung a cappella. 176. A glee is a vocal composition in three or more parts, being usually more simple in style than the madrigal, and sometimes having more than one movement. The glee may be either gay or sad in mood, and seems to be a composition peculiar to the English people. 177. A part song is a composition for two or more voices, usually four, to be sung a cappella. It is written in monophonic rather than polyphonic style. Thus differing from the madrigal and glee. Morley's Now is the Month of Maying is an example of the part song, as is also Sullivan's O、oh、Hush Thee, My Baby. The term part song is often loosely applied to glees, madrigals, etc. End of chapter 16. Recording by Miriam Esther Goldman. Chapter seventeen of Music Notation and Terminology. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruth Golding. Music Notation and Terminology by Carl Wilson Gerkins. Chapter seventeen Rhythm, Melody, Harmony, and Intervals. 178. The four elements commonly attributed to music in the order of their development are rhythm, melody, harmony, and timbre, or tone color. 179. Rhythm is the regular recurrence of accent. In music, it is more specifically the regular recurrence of groups of accented and non accented beats, or pulses. According to some specified measure system. Since rhythm implies continuity, there must usually be at least two such measure groups in order to make musical rhythm possible. See page 44, section 97 for measure. 180. A melody is a succession of single tones of various pitches so arranged that the effect of the whole will be unified. Coherent and pleasing to the ear. The soprano part of hymn tunes and other simple harmonized compositions is often referred to as the melody. 181. Harmony is the science of chord construction and combination. The term harmony refers to tones sounding simultaneously, i.e., to chords. As differentiated from tones sounding consecutively, as in melody. The word harmony may therefore be applied to any group of tones of different pitches sounded as a chord, although specifically we usually refer to a succession of such chords when we speak of harmony. It is possible to use the same combination of tones in either melody or harmony. In fact, these two elements, as applied to modern music, have developed together, and the style of present day melody is directly based upon the development that has recently taken place in harmonic construction. Harmony, as contrasted with counterpoint, first began to be an important factor in music about 1600 AD, i.e., at the time when opera and oratorio came into existence. When form was established, and when our modern major and minor scales were adopted. Before this, practically all music was composed on a contrapuntal basis. 182. Timbre is that peculiar quality of sound which enables one to distinguish a tone produced by one instrument or voice from a tone produced by an equal number of vibrations on another instrument. 
the word timbre is synonymous with the terms quality of tone and tone quality german klangfarbe the excuse for using it being that it expresses adequately in one word an idea that in our language takes at least two this excuse would disappear and incidentally a much mispronounced word would be eliminated if the single word quality were to be adopted as the equivalent of timbre thus e g the soprano voice singing middle c has a quality different from the contralto voice singing the same tone the remainder of this chapter and all of chapter eighteen deal with terms commonly encountered in the study of harmony courses in this subject usually begin with a study of scales but since this subject has already been somewhat extensively treated this chapter will omit it and will begin with the next topic in harmony study viz the interval one eighty three an interval is the relation of two tones with regard to pitch if the two tones are sounded simultaneously the result is an harmonic interval but if sounded consecutively the result is a melodic interval figure sixty two represents the pitches f and a above middle c as a harmonic interval figure sixty two while figure sixty three represents the same pitches arranged as a melodic interval figure sixty three one eighty four in classifying intervals two facts should be constantly kept in mind one the number name of the interval third fifth sixth etc is derived from the order of letters as found in the diatonic scale thus the interval c to e is a third because e is the third tone counting from c counting c as one in the diatonic scale c to g is a fifth because g is the fifth tone above c in the diatonic scale it should be noted however that the same number names apply even though one or both letters of the interval are qualified by sharps flats etc thus e g c to g sharp is still a fifth as are also c sharp to g flat and c flat to g sharp two in determining the specific name of any interval perfect fifth major third etc the half step and whole step often referred to respectively as minor second and major second are used as units of measurement the half step is usually defined as the smallest usable interval between two tones thus c to c sharp is a half step as are also b to c f to g flat etc a whole step consists of two half steps c to d is a whole step as are also b flat to c e to f sharp f sharp to g sharp g flat to a flat etc the expressions half step and whole step are much to be preferred to half tone and whole tone as being more clear and definite thus e g the sentence the two tones are a half step apart is much better than the two tones are a half tone apart one eighty five a prime is the relation between two tones whose pitches are properly represented by the same degree of the staff a perfect prime is one whose notes have the same pitch middle c sounded by piano and violin at the same time would offer an example an augmented prime is one whose second tone is one half step higher than the first example c c sharp one eighty six a second is the relation between two tones whose pitches are properly represented by adjacent degrees of the staff the first line and first space are adjacent degrees as are also the third line and fourth space a minor second is one comprising one half step example b c 
A major second is one comprising two half steps. Example B, C sharp. An augmented second is one comprising three half steps. Example F, G sharp. 187. A third is an interval comprising two seconds. A diminished third has two minor seconds, i.e. two half steps, C to E double flat. A minor third has one minor and one major second, i.e. three half steps, C to E flat. A major third has two major seconds, i.e. four half steps, C to E. 188. A fourth is an interval comprising three seconds. A diminished fourth has two minor and one major second, C sharp, F. A perfect fourth has one minor and two major seconds, C, F. An augmented fourth, tritone, has three major seconds, C, F sharp. 189. A fifth is an interval comprising four seconds. A diminished fifth has two minor and two major seconds, C, G flat. A perfect fifth has one minor and three major seconds, C, G. An augmented fifth has four major seconds, C, G sharp. 190. A sixth is an interval comprising five seconds. A minor sixth has two minor and three major seconds, C, A flat. A major sixth has one minor and four major seconds, C, A. An augmented sixth has five major seconds, C, A sharp. 191. A seventh is an interval comprising six seconds. A diminished seventh has three minor and three major seconds, C, B double flat. A minor seventh has two minor and four major seconds, C, B flat. A major seventh has one minor and five major seconds, C, B. 192. An octave is an interval comprising seven seconds. A diminished octave has three minor and four major seconds, C, C flat. A perfect octave has two minor and five major seconds, C, C. An augmented octave has one minor and six major seconds, C, C sharp. 193. A ninth is usually treated as a second, a tenth as a third, etc. The interval of two octaves is often referred to as a fifteenth. 194. If the major diatonic scale be written, and the interval between each tone and the key tone noted, it will be observed that the intervals are all either major or perfect. Figure 64. Perfect prime, no steps. Major second, one step. Major third, two steps. Perfect fourth, two and a half steps. Perfect fifth, three and a half steps. Major sixth, four and a half steps. Major seventh, five and a half steps. Perfect octave, six steps. In this connection also, it will be noted that the interval next smaller than major is always minor, while that next smaller than perfect or minor is always diminished, but that the interval next larger than both major and perfect is augmented. 195. An interval is said to be inverted when the tone originally the upper becomes the lower. Thus, C, E, a major third, inverted becomes E, C, a minor sixth. End of chapter 17 
notation and terminology. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Todd Garrison. Music Notation and Terminology by Carl Wilson Gerkins. Chapter 18. Chords, Cadences, Etc. A chord is a combination of several tones, sounding together and bearing an harmonic relation to each other. The simplest chord is the triad, which consists of a fundamental tone called the root, with the third and fifth above it. C E G is a triad, as are also D F A, F A C, and G B D. Triads are classified as major, minor, diminished, or augmented. A major triad has a major third and a perfect fifth. It is a major third with a minor third on top of it. Example, C, E, G. A minor triad has a minor third and a perfect fifth. It is a minor third with a major third on top of it. Example, C, E flat, G. A diminished triad has a minor third and a diminished fifth. It is a minor third with another minor third on top of it. Example, C, E flat, G flat. An augmented triad has a major third and an augmented fifth. It is a major third with another major third on top of it. Example, C, E, G sharp. A triad may be built on any scale tone, but those on 1, 4, and 5 are used so much oftener than the others that they are often called the common chords. In referring to triads, the Roman numerals are used to show on what scale tone the triad is based. The size of the numeral, with other signs, indicating the kind of triad found on each tone of the scale. Thus, the large one shows that the triad on the first tone in major is a major triad. The small two shows that the triad on the second tone is minor, etc. The following figure will make this clear. Figure 65. Major triad, large numeral 1. Minor triad, small numeral 2. Minor triad, small numeral 3. Major triad, large numeral 4. Major triad, large numeral 5. Minor triad, small numeral 6. Diminished triad, small numeral 7 with a degree sign. Reduplication of first triad. The triads in the minor scale are as follows. Minor triad, small numeral 1. Diminished triad, small numeral 2 with a degree sign. Augmented triad, large numeral 3 with a plus sign, or large numeral 3 with a tick. Minor triad, small numeral 4. Major triad, large numeral 5. Major triad, large numeral 6. Diminished triad, small numeral 7 with a degree sign. Reduplication of first triad. A triad is said to be in fundamental position when its root is the lowest tone. It is said to be in the first inversion when the third is the lowest tone, and in the second inversion when the fifth is the lowest tone. Thus, in figure 66, the same chord, C, E, G, is arranged in three different positions. At A, in fundamental position, at B, in the first inversion, and at C, in the second inversion. Figure 66. When the root is not the bass note, figures are sometimes used to show what chord is to be played or written. Thus, the figure 6 over a bass note means the note given is the third of a chord, the root being found by going up a sixth from the bass note. The chord is to be sounded in its first inversion. In the same way, the figures 6 slash 4 indicate that the note given is the fifth of the chord, the root and fifth being found by going up a sixth and a fourth from the given note. The chord is to be sounded in its second inversion. The use of these and other similar figures and signs is called figured bass, or thorough bass notation. An example of figured bass is given in figure 67.
thorough bass notation was formerly used extensively in writing accompaniments to vocal works, the accompanist having to interpret the notes and signs given, and then to make up an interesting accompaniment as he went along. Much of Handel's music was written in this way. But in modern editions of these works, the chords have been printed in full and the signs omitted. A seventh chord consists of a fundamental tone with its third, fifth, and seventh. The fifth is sometimes omitted. A ninth chord consists of a fundamental with its third, fifth, seventh, and ninth. A cadence is the close of a musical phrase. In a melody, it refers to the last two tones, in harmony to the last two chords. The word cadence is derived from cadere, a Latin word meaning to fall, the reference being to the falling of the voice, the dropping to the normal pitch at the close of a sentence. The most frequent cadence in harmony is that involving the chord on one, preceded by the chord on five. Because of its directness, the cadence five one is called the authentic cadence. The most satisfactory form to the ear of the authentic cadence is that in which the highest voice, the soprano, of the final chord is the root of that chord. When the final chord appears in this position, the cadence is called perfect authentic. And when the third or fifth of the chord appear in the soprano, the cadence is called imperfect authentic. Figure 68 shows the chord G, B, D cadencing to C, E, G in three different ways. The first one, A, is called a perfect authentic cadence. But the last two, C and D, are imperfect authentic. Figure 68 A B C A plagal cadence is one in which the tonic chord is preceded by the subdominant chord, 4, 1. The plagal cadence, sometimes called the church cadence or amen cadence, like the authentic, is described as being perfect when the soprano of the tonic chord is the root of that chord, and imperfect when the soprano of the final chord is the third or fifth of that chord. Figure 69 shows the chord F, A, C cadencing to C, E, G in three ways. The first one, A, is called a perfect plagal cadence. The last two are imperfect plagal. Figure 69 A B C A half cadence occurs when the dominant chord is used as the final chord of a phrase and is immediately preceded by the tonic chord. This form is used to give variety in the course of a composition, but is not available at the end because it does not give a definite close in the tonic key. Figure 70 shows the use of the half cadence at the close of such a phrase. Figure 70, Bach. A deceptive cadence is the progression of the dominant chord to some other chord than the tonic. The word deceptive, implying that the ear expects to hear 5 resolved to 1 and is deceived when it does not do so. The most common form of deceptive cadence is that in which 5, or 5 7, resolves to 6. It is used to give variety, but as in the case of the half cadence, it is not available at the end of a composition. Figure 71 gives an example. Figure 71, W. M. Mather. A sequence is a succession of similar harmonic progressions, these resulting from a typical or symmetrical movement of the bass part. See figure 72. The word sequence is also applied to a succession of similar melodic progressions, as in figure 73. Modulation is a change of key without any break in the continuity of chords or melody tones. 
harmonic modulations are usually affected through the medium of a chord, some or all of whose tones are common to both keys. Examples of both harmonic and melodic modulations are shown in figures 74 and 75. Figure 74 C major F major The chord most frequently used in modulating is the dominant 7th, a 7th chord on the dominant tone of the key. In the key of C, this chord is G, B, D, F. In the key of D, it is A, C sharp, E, G. In the key of A flat, it is E flat, G, B flat, D flat, etc. Figure 75. G. Two. D. A suspension is the temporary substitution of a tone a degree higher than the regular chord tone, this temporary tone being later replaced by the regular chord tone. See figure 76. A. Figure 76. A retardation is the temporary substitution of a tone a degree lower than the regular tone. This tone has, in the case of the suspension, being later replaced by the regular chord tone. See Figure 77A. Figure 77. The regular chord tone to which both suspension and retardation resolve is called the tone of resolution. Anticipation is a chord tone introduced just before the rest of the chord to which it belongs is sounded. See Figure 78A. Figure 78. A. A pedal point or organ point is a tone sustained through a succession of harmonic progressions to the chords of some of which it usually belongs. The term pedal point originated in organ playing, where the foot on a pedal can sustain a tone while the hands are playing a succession of harmonies. But as now used, it may be applied to any kind of music. The dominant and tonic are the tones most often used in this way. See figure 79. Figure 79, Schumann. When the upper three voices of a four-voice composition are written close together, the soprano and tenor never appearing more than an octave apart, the term close position is applied. But when the upper voices are not written close together, the term open position is applied. By transposition, it is meant playing, singing, or writing a piece of music in some other key than the original. Thus, if a song written in the key of G is too high in range for a soloist, the accompanist sometimes transposes it to a lower key, as F or E, thus causing all tones to sound a second or third lower than they did when the same song was played in the original key. End of chapter 18 Recorded by Todd Garrison, Denver, Colorado. 13 of Music Notation and Terminology. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Music Notation and Terminology by Carl Wilson Gerkins. Chapter 13. Dynamics. 120. The word dynamics... CF dynamic, the opposite of static, as used in the nomenclature of music, has to do with the various degrees of power, i.e. the comparative loudness and softness, of tones. As in the case of words referring to tempo, the expressions referring to dynamics are always relative, never absolute. It is possible to indicate that one measure is to be louder than another, but it is not possible, nor desirable, to indicate exactly how loud either is to be. Thus dynamics, perhaps even more than tempo, will be seen to depend on the taste of the performer or conductor. The following words referring to dynamics are in common use. Pianissimo, PPP, as softly as possible. It will be noted that this is a sort of hyper-superlative of piano. Pianissimo, PP, very softly, the superlative of piano. 
Piano, P, softly. Mezzo piano, MP, medium softly. Mezzo forte, MF, medium loudly. Forte, F, loudly, literally strong. Fortissimo, FF, very loudly, the superlative of forte. Fortississimo, FFF, as loudly as possible. The lack of a one-word comparative degree in the case of both piano and forte seems to necessitate the hyper-superlative degree as given above, but the practice of using four, or even five, P's or F's is not desirable. 121. The terms defined in section 120 are often combined with others, as, e.g., pianissimo possibile, as softly as possible, piano assai, very softly, fortissimo possibile, as loudly as possible, forte piano, fp, loud, followed at once by soft. As in the case of terms relating to tempo, the meaning of many other expressions relating to dynamics may easily be arrived at by recalling the list of auxiliary terms quoted under section 96. 122. The terms sforzando, forzando, sforzato, and forzato all indicate a strong accent on a single tone or chord. These words are abbreviated as follows. SF, FZ, and SFZ, the abbreviation being placed directly above, sometimes below, the note or chord affected. The signs, here's an illustration of an upward pointing accent symbol, and a sideways pointing accent symbol, are also commonly used to indicate such an accent. In interpreting these accent marks, the student must bear in mind again the fact that they have a relative rather than an absolute meaning. The mark SF occurring in the midst of a piano passage will indicate a much milder form of accent than would the same mark occurring in the midst of a forte passage. 123. The words rinforzando and rinforzato, abbreviated RINF and RFZ, mean literally reinforced and are used to indicate a sudden increase in power, usually extending over an entire phrase or passage, instead of applying only to a single tone or chord, as in the case of sforzando, etc. 124. Crescendo, abbreviated C-R-E-S-C, -E or, drawing of a crescendo symbol, means a gradual increase in power. It will be noted that this word does not mean loud, nor does it mean a sudden increase in power, unless accompanied by some auxiliary term, such as subito or molto. Broadly speaking, there are two varieties of crescendo. 1. That in which the same tone increases in power while being prolonged. 2. That in which succeeding tones are each sounded more strongly than the preceding one. The first variety is possible only on instruments giving forth a tone which can be varied after it begins, thus, e.g., the human voice, the violin, the organ enclosed in a swell-box, and certain wind instruments, are all capable of sounding a tone softly at first, and gradually increasing the volume until the maximal point of power has been reached. But on the piano, organ not enclosed in a swell-box, kettle-drum, etc., the power of the tone cannot be varied after the tone has once been sounded, and a crescendo effect is therefore possible only in a passage, in rendering which each succeeding tone is struck more forcibly than its immediate predecessor. This second variety of crescendo offers a means of dramatic effect, which may be employed most strikingly, as, e.g., when a long passage begins very softly, and increases in power little by little, until the utmost resources of the instrument or orchestra have been reached. A notable example of such an effect is found in the transition from the third to the fourth movements of the Beethoven Fifth Symphony. The difference between sforzando, rinforzando, and crescendo should now be noted. 
Sforzando indicates that a single tone or chord is to be louder. Rinforzando, that an entire passage is to be louder, beginning with its first tone. But crescendo indicates that there is to be a gradual increase in power, this increase sometimes occurring during the sounding of a single tone, but more often in a passage. 125. Certain combinations of the word crescendo with other words are so common that they should be especially noted. Among these are crescendo al fortissimo, keep on gradually increasing in power until the fortissimo, or very loud, point has been reached. Crescendo subito, increase in power suddenly or rapidly. Crescendo poco a poco, increase in power very, very gradually. Crescendo poi diminuendo, first increase, then diminish the tone. Crescendo e diminuendo, same as crescendo poi diminuendo. Crescendo molto, increase in power very greatly. Crescendo ed animando poco a poco, growing gradually louder in tone and quicker in tempo. Crescendo ed affrettando, gradually louder and faster. Crescendo poco a poco sin al fine, crescendo gradually even up to the very end. 126. Decrescendo, D-E-C-R-E-S-C, -E -E or decrescendo symbol, means a gradual diminishing of the tone. It is the opposite of crescendo. The word diminuendo is synonymous with decrescendo. Decrescendo, or diminuendo, al pianissimo, means decrease gradually in power until the pianissimo, or very soft point, is reached. 127. A number of terms referring to both softer tone and slower tempo are in use. The most common of these are mancando, moriente, begin footnote. Both moriente and morendo mean literally dying. End footnote. Morendo, perdendo, from perdere, to lose, perdendosi, calando, and smorzando. Begin footnote. From smorzare, Italian, to extinguish. End footnote. Such expressions are usually translated, gradually dying away. 128. In piano music, the abbreviation PED indicates that the damper pedal, the one at the right, is to be depressed, while the sign, here's sort of a big blurry asterisk, shows that it is to be released. In many modern editions, this depression and release of the damper pedal are more accurately indicated by the sign, and here's a regular pedal symbol. The term senza sordini is also occasionally found in old editions, indicating that the damper pedal is to be depressed, while con sordini shows that it is to be released. These expressions are taken from a usage in music for stringed instruments, in which the term con sordini means that the mute, a small clamp of metal, ivory, or hardwood, is to be affixed to the bridge, this causing a modification in both power and quality of the tone. The damper on the piano does not in any way correspond to the mute thus used on stringed instruments, and the terms above explained as sometimes occurring in piano music are not to be recommended, even though Beethoven used them in this sense in all his earlier sonatas. 129. The words una corda, literally one string, indicate that the soft pedal, the one at the left, is to be depressed, while the words tre corde, literally three strings, or tutte le corde, all the strings, show that the same pedal is to be released. These expressions refer to the fact that on grand pianos the soft pedal, when depressed, moves the hammers to one side, so that instead of striking three strings they strike only two, in the older pianos only one, hence una corda, all three strings, tre corde, being struck again after the release of the pedal. 130. Other terms relating either directly or indirectly to the subject of dynamics are con alcuna licenza, with some degree of license, con amore, with tenderness, con bravura, with boldness, 
con celerita with rapidity con delicato with delicacy con energico with energy con espressione with expression con forza with force con fuoco with fire and passion con gran espressione with great expression con grazia with grace con melinconia with melancholy con passione with passion con spirito with spirit con tenerezza with tenderness delicato delicately dolce sweetly gently dolcissimo most sweetly dolce e cantabile gently and with singing tone dolente or doloroso plaintively or sorrowfully espressivo expressively grandioso grandly pompously grazioso gracefully giocoso humorously cf giocose giojoso joyfully cf joyous lacrimando lacrimoso sorrowfully legato smoothly leggero lightly leggerissimo most lightly almost a staccato lusingando caressingly coaxingly tenderly maesta maestoso majestically martellando martellato strongly accented literally hammered marziale martial warlike mesto pensively mezzo voce with half voice misterioso mysteriously parlando well accented or enunciated applied to melody playing the word parlando means literally speaking pastorale in simple and unaffected style literally pastoral rural pomposo pompously precipitoso precipitously recitativo well enunciated this meaning applies only in instrumental music in which a melody is to stand out above the accompaniment for definition of recitative in vocal music see page 78 risoluto firmly resolutely scherzando scherzoso etc jokingly these terms are derived from the word scherzo meaning a musical joke semplice simply sempre marcatissimo always well marked i e strongly accented sentimento with sentiment solenne solemn sotto voce in subdued voice spiritoso with spirit strepitoso precipitously tranquillo tranquilly tristamente sadly one thirty one many other terms are encountered which on their face sometimes seem to be quite formidable but which yield readily to analysis thus e g crescendo poco a poco al forte ed un pochinetto accelerando is seen to mean merely increase gradually to forte and accelerate a very little bit a liberal application of common sense will aid greatly in the interpretation of such expressions end of chapter 13 read by kara schallenberg www.kra.org on august 1st 2009 in san diego california Music Notation and Terminology. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Music Notation and Terminology by Carl Wilson Gerkins. Chapter 14. Terms Relating to Forms and Styles. 132. A form in music is a specific arrangement of the various parts of a composition resulting in a structure so characteristic 
that it is easily recognized by the ear. Thus, e.g., although every fugue is different from all other fugues in actual material, yet the arrangement of the various parts is so characteristic that no one who knows the fugue form has any doubt as to what kind of a composition he is hearing whenever a fugue is played. The word form is therefore seen to be somewhat synonymous with the word plan, as used in architecture. It is the structure or design underlying music. Examples of form are the canon, the fugue, the sonata, etc. Speaking broadly, we may say that form, in any art, consists in the placing together of certain parts in such relations of proportion and symmetry as to make a unified whole. In music this implies unity of tonality and of general rhythmic effect, as well as unity in the grouping of the various parts of the work, phrases, periods, movements, so as to weld them into one whole, giving the impression of completeness to the hearer. 133. The primal basis of form is the repetition of some characteristic effect, and the problem of the composer is to bring about these repetitions in such a way that the ear will recognize them as being the same material, and will nevertheless not grow weary of them. This is accomplished by varying the material, cf. thematic development, by introducing contrasting material, and by choice of key. 134. The student should note at the outset of this topic the difference in meaning between the terms form and style. A form is a plan for building a certain definite kind of composition, but a style is merely a manner of writing. Thus, e.g., the fugue is a form, i.e., it is a plan, which, although capable of variation in details, is yet carried out fairly definitely in every case. But counterpoint is merely a style or manner of writing, just as Gothic architecture is a style of building, which may be cast into any one of several forms. 135. The material found in the following sections is an attempt to explain in simple language certain terms relating to forms and styles which are in common use. In many cases the definition is too meager to give anything but a very general idea, but it is hoped that the student will at least be set to thinking, and that he will eventually be led to a more detailed and scholarly study of the subject. The article, form, and the separate articles under each term here defined, as found in Grove's Dictionary, are especially recommended. For examples of the various forms described see also Mason and Surrette, The Appreciation of Music, Supplementary Volume. 136. In a very general way, there may be said to be two styles of musical composition, the monophonic, or homophonic, the one-voiced, and the polyphonic, the many-voiced. The polyphonic, begin footnote, polyphonic music flourished from 1000 A.D. to about 1750 A.D., the culmination of the polyphonic period being reached in the music of Johann Sebastian Bach, 1685 to 1750. Haydn, Mozart, Beethoven, and the later writers have used the monophonic style more than the polyphonic, although a combination of the two is often found, as, e.g., in the later works of Beethoven. End footnote. The polyphonic style antedates the monophonic historically. 137. In monophonic music there is one voice which has a pronounced melody, the other voices, if present, supporting this melody as a harmonic, and often rhythmic, background. An example of this is the ordinary hymn tune, with its melody in the highest part, and with three other voices forming a four-part harmony. The sonata, symphony, opera, modern piano piece, etc., are also largely monophonic, though polyphonic passages, by way of contrast, are often to be found. 138. In polyphonic music, each voice is, to a certain extent, melodically interesting, and the harmony is the result of combining several melodies in such a way as to give a pleasing effect, instead of treating a melody by adding chords as an accompaniment or support. Counterpoint, canon, round, fugue, etc., are all polyphonic in style. The word contrapuntal is often used synonymously with polyphonic. 
sections 139 to 143, relate especially to terms describing polyphonic music. 139. Counterpoint is the art of adding one or more parts or melodies to a given melody, the latter being known as the cantus firmus, or subject. It may therefore be broadly defined as the art of combining melodies. The word counterpoint comes from the three words punctus contra punctum, meaning point against point. The word point, as here used, refers to the punctus, one of the pneumae of the medieval system, these pneumae being the immediate predecessors of modern notes. Both vocal and instrumental music have been written in contrapuntal style. The familiar two- and three-part inventions, by Bach, are excellent examples of instrumental counterpoint, while such choruses as those in The Messiah by Handel illustrate the highest type of vocal counterpoint. 140. Imitation is the repetition by one part of a subject or theme previously introduced by another part. If the imitation is exact, the term strict imitation is applied, but if only approximate, then the term free imitation is used in referring to it. The repetition need not have the exact pitches of the subject in order to be strict. On the contrary, the imitation is usually at the interval of an octave or a fifth or a second, etc. Figure 57 shows an example of strict imitation in which the third part comes in an octave lower than the first part. 141. A canon is a contrapuntal composition in the style of strict imitation, one part repeating exactly, but at any interval, what another part has played or sung. The term canonic style is sometimes applied to music in which the imitation is not exact. An example of three-part canon is given in figure 57. Canon in three voices in the unison and octave by Mozart. The word canon means law, and was applied to this particular form of composition because the rules relating to its composition were invariable. It is because of this non-flexibility that the canon is so little used as a form at the present time. The modern composer demands a plan of writing that is capable of being varied to such an extent as to give him room for the exercise of his own particular individuality of conception, and this the canon does not do. For the same reason, too, the fugue and the sonata have successively gone out of fashion, and from Schumann down to the present time, composers have, as it were, created their own forms, the difficulty in listening arising from the fact that no one but the composer himself could recognize the form as a form, because it had not been adopted to a great enough extent by other composers to make it in any sense universal. The result is that in much present-day music it is very difficult for the hearer to discover any trace of familiar design, and the impression made by such music is, in consequence, much less definite than that made by music of the classic school. It is probable that a reaction from this state of affairs will come in the near future, for in any art it is necessary that there should be at least enough semblance of structure to make the artwork capable of standing as a universal thing rather than as the mere temporary expression of some particular composer or of some period of composition. 142. The common school round is an example of canon, each voice repeating exactly what the first voice has sung, while this first voice is going on with its melody. The round is therefore defined as a variety of canon in which the imitation is always in unison with the subject. 143. The fugue, Latin fuga, flight, is a form of contrapuntal composition in which the imitation is always in the dominant key, i.e., a fifth above or a fourth below. The imitation, called the answer, may be an exact repetition of the subject, sometimes called the question, but is usually not so. 
The fugue differs from the canon also in that the subject is given in complete form before the answer begins, while in the canon the imitation begins while the subject is still going on. The fugue is not nearly so strict in form as the canon, and gives the composer much greater opportunity for expressing musical ideas. A canon may be perfect in form, and yet be very poor music. This same statement might, of course, be made about any form, but is especially true in the stricter ones. End of chapter 14, read by Kara Schallenberg on August 24, 2009, in San Diego, California.